I'm Nicola Talent and you're watching Crime World, a podcast about criminals, drugs and the underworld in Ireland and across the globe. Make sure you subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications so you can be the first to watch all our latest episodes. You can also listen wherever you get your podcasts. Lucy Letby, um, the case has really caused a lot of shock in in the UK and in Ireland. I mean, I think some of the, the shock is caused by the fact that people are really struggling to find a motive for what she did. Do you feel that's one of the big questions that remains kind of unanswered even still? I mean, when you think about female serial killers, infanticide is actually one of the most common things that they do. So I suppose that is in keeping with what we'd expect to see. So killing children tends to be killing children or poisoning, for example, you know, for financial gain, shall we say. So typology wise, she does fit there. But arguably, when you look at other factors, she really doesn't necessarily be that fabric that we'd expect to see. So She's not suffered from anything that seems like a mental disorder. You know, not that mental illness makes you a killer, but certainly what we'd say is that often in the background of these killers, there might be something regarding personality disorders that would be very demonstrable to the public in court when it's brought forward by psychiatrists and psychologists. And I guess that she doesn't typology wise in her background have any historic criminality she isn't married. You expect her to be married if she's going to be a female serial killer. And also the fact that her friends have stoically stood by her, which is quite unusual. I know that people are saying that, well, when you love somebody, that's what you do. But I mean, arguably, that isn't the case in lots of cases, certainly where babies being killed are concerned. So I think that's why there is a yes, she fits certain areas of the paradigm. And no, it's really difficult to understand how this fresh-faced, pretty young woman who was meant to be incredibly committed to her job has actually ended up on a full-life tariff in prison for the murder of defenceless babies. It's almost impossible to hold those two things in the same sentence. You know, it's like cognitive dissonance. How can this person who looks so perfect and seemingly has been so perfect, arguably, apparently, be so deeply malevolent and evil without anything that would have led us to have seen that in her background. No, I mean, and, you know, if we look back at the the, the serial killers or the people that fit that bill in Ireland, and I, I imagine it's the same in the UK, you're nearly always, uh, there's a, nearly always a traumatic, you know, background in terms of a history, people suffering a history of violence, or as you said, some sort of obvious personality disorder, some sort of antisocial personality disorder that nearly always would have been expressed before somebody hits their sort of mid-30s as as Lucy Leppy is. Absolutely. What you said is totally pertinent. So you would certainly expect that there would be trauma, that there would be some level of abuse in their history. And with respect, her parents seem to be incredibly devoted, incredibly loving. Her family has been very close some would say, and I've seen it reported, that they're too close because she was saying it would be difficult for her to move away. But that's actually really normal. When you're in a close family, it's actually the most normal thing to be like, oh, my parents would be devastated. I don't think that says that there's horribly fused family who just can't survive with one another. That isn't true. I think that's very typical of a loving family. And arguably, it's not just the family cohort that looks at the situation and you say well that doesn't really fit with what we'd usually expect to see it's the fact that she's sustained very long-term relationships with people they've always been really positive she's been known to be an incredibly kind person and she hasn't had any shades to her personality that have been obvious to those around her and one can argue well okay btk dennis radar was the devoted family man by day so therefore, it is very possible for serial killers to be absolute chameleons. But as noted, when you look in the histories and experience of family dynamics, you do expect to see that there will have been a severe disruption early on in life on the whole. And that hasn't been the case for Letby whatsoever. And I think that's probably testament to why so many people are refusing to accept that firstly, she's guilty, or secondly, that she deserves abandonment. So people who love her still love her and they don't believe that she's guilty. Because, I mean, normally in, in terms of, say, a personality disorder or, you know, those sort of general terms, like a history of chaotic relationships really right. would be there, I would have thought. 
certainly you would expect that she would have something. I guess when you look at people who are very organized in their serial killing and like, let's put it into the context. Let's just for a minute pose the idea that she is an organized serial killer and that she follows that typology. Well, we do expect that they're above average intelligence. We do expect that there's somebody who's going to have long-term relationships. Sometimes they'll be married for decades. Their partner will have no idea of what they're doing in their private time. They tend to be individuals who hold down a skilled position. There'll be somebody who's very socially adept and there'll be an individual who's in skilled employment. So that's what we do expect to genuinely see in the way that somebody is acting. So sure, we can say that she fits all of those. That's what she was doing. But arguably, that's because serial killers are chameleons and they do what the average person does. What is a little bit more challenging, as you've noted, is to get your head around, well, what is it that triggered and activated this person from going from this apparently very lovely human being to this deeply malevolent evil human who catastrophically impacted on the lives of so many families and destroyed the lives of so many children. It's difficult to kind of stand and hold those two scenarios in the same space. But if she is truly an organized serial killer, that would be her main weapon, that she was able to fool literally everyone around her. And I guess you would say there is an anomaly here looking at her background, both on, as you noted, when it comes down to somebody who would be denoted as having a personality disorder or even somebody who might have some mental instability, none of that's there, but there will always be anomalies in killing. So that in itself, think about Joanna Dennehy. She's a thrill killer who's female. She murdered completely innocent individuals and tried to kill another two men. So three men were killed, two were nearly killed. She isn't meant to fit that typology at all because thrill killers aren't female, if that makes sense. So therefore, there's always going to be somebody who falls outside the parameters of expectation. But I think for Let Be, it's not really just to do with the fact that she's very peaches and cream and English rose, which she is. I think it's also to do with the fact that a lot of the evidence seems circumstantial and people don't like circumstantial cases. Even if somebody is guilty, what you want to feel is, there is absolutely no way whatsoever that this person isn't guilty. That's how you feel that justice has been served. And when there are questions around that, I think that's why people have an additional struggle with this case, so to speak. Yeah, and of course, like this is the same in in, in Ireland as in the UK. Somebody can be convicted of murder on circumstantial evidence. It is, yes. it is legitimate. It's a, a valid way. However, you know, just to go back into a bit of the uh, the evidence, like she's... She's been convicted of uh, murdering seven babies and the attempted murder of six more. Um, yeah. Without going into all of the great details of it, um, there was a number of children died, obviously, in 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 a hospital in Cheshire. Um, in that time, during all of these incidents, Lucy Leppy was working. That was one of the strands of, of circumstantial evidence. Um, there was also... Postmortems were able to show that at least a couple of the the, the children that had died had been injected with um, insulin. Insulin, yes. Um, so there was proof that the children had been at least died as a result of that. Um, but some of the other circumstantial evidence was um, from Lucy Letby's own hands, maybe her her diaries and some notes she'd taken. Could you tell us a bit about that? One of the things that I think is problematic about the notes and. Arguably, I understand why they were allowed to bring those notes in. It was because she'd written things like, I'm evil. I did this. But she also wrote really self-depreciating information about the fact that she was a terrible person, that she would never get married, she'd never have children. And from a psychological perspective, that to me is completely normal when you're under suspicion for something like this. It's a little bit like when you're a teenager and you write the most heinous things about yourself in your diary, that if somebody else was to look into that diary, might make you out to be somebody who was struggling severely with your mental health or might indeed believe some of the things that you've said that might be entirely fabricated because you just feel terrible about who you are and you're writing really nasty things about yourself. We see that time and time again. So for me, I really struggled actually with that being allowed into evidence purely because on a psychological level, somebody in distress will say and do and write things about themselves that are wholly inaccurate, such as, as I said, I am evil. You know, I could write that about myself on a terrible day when I was a younger person in particular, but I'm not evil. And it wouldn't indicate that I'd done anything that was evil. So 
I don't feel that strong evidence genuinely on a criminal level, but also if I was looking at her psychologically, I would be thinking that's a self-loathing. That's an owning. That's a saying to myself, these people believe this about me. Therefore, I'm going to write this stuff about me. I'm going to own it. And that doesn't mean, by the way, that I'm saying that she didn't do this. I'm just saying that that particular piece of evidence, I think it was very compelling. I think if you are not educated in therapeutic field, you will believe that that is actually something verbatim. And that worries me on a jury level because I would look at that as an admission of guilt, right? And arguably, it's hard to pedal back from that admission of guilt if it's presented in that way. So that particular piece of evidence, I don't find tangible and palpable in a way that I would wish to have seen it being used in court because I, I think that it's something that really is persuasive. When it comes down to the other stuff, you know, she was present at all the deaths. So when you say law of averages, you go, well, okay, who was the person who was most there? It was her. And arguably for the doctors involved, when they start to try to put this together, they're going to be like, well, she's always present. But then equally, and this is where I come from understanding both sides, people would say, yes, well, she was a really dedicated nurse who took extra shifts and wanted to be available to those children. So therefore, is it her actual commitment, dedication and perseverance that means that she becomes culpable for something that actually she isn't guilty of? So I can see that side of it as well. When it comes down to the insulin, obviously it wasn't injected insulin into the bodies of the children. So there weren't injection sites. It was into bags. So there was a the belief that she'd injected insulin into bags. And the way that that process is in the body is very different to how it would be if it had been directly injected or it was naturally occurring, so to speak. So they can definitely see that somebody was trying to harm those babies. And as much as there's been a lot of negative press about the way that that hospital was acting and they were understaffed, they were overwhelmed, you can't place blame on the hospital staff because they were just being in an environment where they were provided with that staffing by those in charge. So arguably this is very common in the NHS that we see understaffing and overwhelmed workers. But what you can say is it's undisputable in spite of the fact there were some messes in processes and it wasn't as hygienic as it should have been. And certainly that could have led to deaths of children. When it comes down to the insulin, it's just something that you can't dispute. It happened. So there is definitely somebody who was malevolent in that environment doing that. And Lucy Letby was the person who was most present at those children's deaths. And it felt at times that she was present at times she shouldn't have been. That in itself, I guess, on a circumstantial level, is probably why the jury tied in with the notes at home. The fact that she took records home with her. She said that she had like a paper addiction to some degree. That isn't uncommon as well. I've known people who do take things from work they shouldn't. But when you add it all together, I guess that when you have to make a decision, do I want to set this person free who could potentially do terrible things to other people versus do I just believe that this circumstantial is enough and weighty enough to convict? I can understand why the jury would have done that. Yeah, and of course, it was a hugely long trial and really, really detailed Um you know, so they 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 were there. They sat there every day. Sometimes it's different yeah. when you when you sit and read about it. You know, than than mm. when, you're, when you are in a trial. I mean, obviously, you know, the the prosecution also made um, you know, made a big deal out of out of some of the fact that she contacted the families on Facebook mm. afterwards. And as you said, I think she took home two hundred and fifty pieces of records, and they at least we're suggesting these were kind of trophies. Would that be sort of, uh, I mean, we always see that in American yeah. TV programs that serial killers want trophies. But is that a common thing or a, a real thing? It's not common in females. It's quite the contrary. So females don't keep mementos. Males do. So organized male serial killers, they will tend to, and signatures, which are part of that to some degree, you know, some people psychologically for their own gratification require an anchor. An anchor is something you can use positively. You know, you can use it to help you with your anxiety if it reminds you of something positive that you carry around in your pocket when you're struggling. Likewise, you can use it for malevolent triggers and anchors. So even though people think about a signature being something like the Zodiac Killer, you know, crosshairs of a gun or BTK, his actual physical signature, you know, of his initials of his name. That isn't how signatures really work in serial killing. They're emotional and psychologically gratifying. And even though mementos are not necessarily the same as a physical signature, because 
you're taking it from the victim and reliving the crime through it, that serves your emotional and psychological gratification. So that, to some degree, would be considered one. But for whatever reason, when you look at female serial killers, they're not really people who collect those things. So that wouldn't be in keeping. But then again, if we're talking about Lucy Letby, she would be a complete anomaly. If she did this, she would be a complete anomaly. And obviously we have to say she did do this because she's been convicted of it. So even my language is in line with my feelings regarding this case, because I'm saying if, but the truth is now it's she has. Does that make sense? So therefore, even I am struggling somehow to process her in the way that I would ordinarily process the serial killer, because I'm very, very able to be incredibly critical and, you know, deriding of these human beings. And rightly so, they are the worst of the worst. They are the most terrible human predators that we could ever imagine. And to kill babies is the worst of the worst of the worst that can be done. They are the most vulnerable and it's interesting that even when I talk about Lucy Letby, there is some kind of physical, emotional resistance to putting her in that category because she feels so unique. And I guess part of my problem is that if I believe that somebody like Letby is capable of doing what she's done, then all of a sudden the world feels an incredibly vulnerable place because I would never have suspected her. And all the way through the trial, I genuinely found myself trying to discount her from guilt throughout. And I wonder whether that's to do with the fact that she is such an anomaly that I find it difficult to accept because it means that I have to think a little bit more clearly and a little bit more openly about the possibilities of predators not wearing the guys I'm used to, actually being different to some of the stereotypes that I've harbored in my life and in my experience and in my work regarding these kind of people. Yeah, I mean, I think you get an instinctive reaction to somebody and it's very hard right. to it's very hard not to to go with that and then look for yeah. evidence to kind of back up that instinctive reaction. Um she yeah. looked, she 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 doesn't look the type obviously. Um if there was a, a you know straight out of typecast serial killer, she really doesn't fit it. Mm. I suppose no. you know with any of these cases and we do cases every every week every month. And, you know, there has, there's always an element of doubt because you're not there and you didn't see what, sure. what happens. You live in a, a civilized society and you trust that, the, you know, that's the basis on which you take it to be true. Somebody is convicted in a court, I suppose. Um, it doesn't mean there haven't been, there's obviously been com- people convicted in courts that have proved oh, yeah. not to be. But uh, it is it is a funny thing because I've sat through trials at times and um, obviously sometimes you you your instinct can even lead you lead you wrong i suppose yeah of course definitely definitely um like i actually was looking through it and um looking through some of the statistics for for female serial killers and um like they the fact that she's a healthcare professional uh that's more normal yeah that, that is that's more tight. normal and it yeah. is and it's also by the way for many uh there have been a number of male serial killing many nurse, nurses as well so do you, have you any concept of why somebody who may have those instincts would would or would end up working in the medical profession same reason why a child molester would go and be a teacher it's about access it's about having people available and vulnerable so we know what serial killers want is availability vulnerability and desirability in victims there is nothing more available and vulnerable than somebody in hospital Firstly, you are in a position of trust, and that means that most people will discount you as being a predator because you're vocationally in a situation where you're seen as an angel, not an angel of death. Secondly, you're authority based. And we know that people conform to authority in a way that they wouldn't do elsewhere. Like if somebody is wearing a stethoscope and a white coat, I guarantee the general public, whether they know that they're a qualified doctor or nurse or otherwise, it will treat them with a higher level of respect. There's no reason to. They're still the same person beneath that coat. But we just allow them this sense of authority and superiority. And they like that. So if you are a predator and you're not vocational, you want people to believe that you're better than them because that plays into your superiority and egomania. Then on top of that, you have access to things like drugs. And the thing about an organized serial killer is they tend to be brighter than the general population. I mean, they're not geniuses on the whole, but, you know, they could be a good 20 higher points on the IQ scale than the average human. 
like they can buy and sell me most of the time in intelligence. So therefore they're going to be better at manipulation and they'll know how to play a system. So arguably, whilst hospitals have got incredibly secure ways of dealing with medication, you can always find a way around it when you're bright. So you've got vulnerable people. You've got people who believe that you're better than them and therefore you're not going to challenge them. You've got access to medication and you basically have people who may die. And you love the fact that people therefore will not suspect necessarily when you end their life in a way that they shouldn't have ended. It's one of the reasons why you know, coroners now demand unexpected deaths in hospital to have autopsies, et cetera, because this has happened time and time again. And I guess there is a big distinction when you look at somebody like Beverly Allett. Beverly Allett was an individual. Firstly, we know that she injected potassium chloride and insulin. We know because of injection sites. We also know she was somebody who was considered to have Munchausen's by proxy, which is factitious disorder. And that means that she was somebody who loved the hero worship that she was given to the degree, actually, where two of the parents made her godparent to their children that she tried killing. You don't get to be more manipulative than that. But we had actual physical evidence and we also had a psychiatric classification. And we also had what I would consider a very malingering personality throughout her whole life, which was that she was constantly trying to get attention for being ill. So she fits the typology, aside from she wasn't in a long term relationship, she wasn't married, that we'd expect for a female serial killer. And it was infanticide. Therefore, again, that fits perfectly with that paradigm. Let be is very different. She just doesn't fit that archetype. And when somebody doesn't fit an archetype, you're either having to relearn what you thought, which is helpful because at the end of the day, I need to relearn these things when I have, as you said, an instinct that's proven to be incorrect. But at the same time, I think that that's why there is so much conversation. And I think there are like petitions now to get her appeal going people are saying she's innocent her friends are all standing by her people are saying she definitely didn't do this and then we're forgetting that listen no matter what is real and what is not what I know is that there are families who are dealing with the absolute grief of losing their babies and now realizing that their babies were murdered and they may have suspected some of that stuff you know themselves and as opposed to the concentration really being on them and what they've gone through and what they've lost and the horror and having that validated, it's almost like it's sidestepped it and the projection is all on let be and what can happen for her next. And I think that that's probably a telling issue that I was talking about earlier on with our bias to believe if it looks good, it must be good. And that's just so incorrect on so many levels. But we do that constantly. If it looks good, it must be good. Lucy let be looks good. She must be good. And I think that that is one of the biggest problems in this case, because if maybe she didn't have the look that she has, maybe people would not struggle quite as much. If she looked like Joanna Dennehy, I don't think that we would be maybe arguing quite as strongly for this problem that we're having accepting that maybe she did do it. As I said, owning it myself in that way, because that's certainly one of the struggles I've had. Yeah, I mean, we, we in, in recent years, we had a female killer, uh, She's ultimately convicted and uh, sentenced to life imprisonment. But she went to court and she had a swastika tattooed on her, on her face, right. like so, like guilty. you know. <laughs> but I mean, it's Straight very, away guilty. <laughs> it's very hard to get over that, you know. So I You're mean, right. yeah, That's bias. That's yeah, exactly that it. is the bias, That's you know. Exactly, yeah, it. it is um, the bias. And even if she'd been completely innocent, yeah, probably the jury in eight seconds would have been like, yeah, she's going down. Whatever the evidence says. Um. However, I saw something interesting. Um. About. Uh, you know, people having covert symptoms of, of, of maybe, I know we're focusing on personality disorders and I'm not meaning to associate mm. that with violence or anything like that. No. But that can be sort of a... Well, antisocial personality disorder, we can align that with violence. I mean, I think that that's one of the problems with personality disorders. When we talk about borderline personality disorder or emotional unstable personality disorder, they somehow get lumped in in this way that people start getting convinced that that must mean that there is something rotten at the core of these tumours. And it's quite the contrary. I mean, with BPD, UPD, yes, they're more likely to probably harm themselves, sadly. And yes, sometimes they have an emotional instability around expressing emotions because they had trauma. So when you're a kid and you can't regulate your safety and your environment's horrible, then you don't have that ability and mechanism to regulate how to react. So sometimes it can be a bit more a little bit more extreme but that 
that's something that requires empathy, care, compassion, and understanding. Whereas EU, you know, we're, we're sorry, antisocial personality disorder. Well, that's a whole different world. You know, that's saying somebody who probably is quite problematic in our society from a spectrum of being somebody who would do things that wouldn't have a conscience associated as would expect through to being a cold blooded killer. You know, that is absolutely true. That's why three in 10 individuals who are in male prisons in the violent population likely have that classification. So there's no way that we cannot say that antisocial personality disorder is not a problem. That's why it's called antisocial. But yeah, with the others, obviously some people can have less obvious symptoms, but nonetheless, they can reside within them. Likewise, with psychopathic personality disorders and antisocial personality disorders, you know, 20% of individuals running senior corporate organizations will have that. Yeah. No one's going around thinking, wow, my boss is a psychopath. You might have some kind of indication that their behavior is off, but you wouldn't necessarily believe it was possible for these individuals to achieve what they've achieved. Of course they can, because you can do a very good thing with your time if you're a person born with those particular problematic behaviors that then get activated but you've got the right postcode the right parents and the right privilege and right opportunity so you don't go off killing people no you just go off ruining people's lives in the corporate world yeah of course and these things can work for people in in, in the sense of it can drive them to success absolutely but with lucy Leppy, there was some evidence given um maybe that showed some sort of lack of uh empathy for her her the victims of these crimes um, for the parents really of, of the of the children involved how did you feel about that did you think that was a good case i mean i think that it's one of those things where if you judge somebody in their worst moments they'll always fail and if you judge somebody in their best moments they'll always succeed so let be certainly as you said did searches on facebook about these individuals, I would also be found guilty of that. Let me tell you, if I see some horrible accident that's occurred, you bet your bottom dollar I'm on Facebook looking up why, because I have such a sympathy and empathy for the victims. I want to feel connected to them. So if you say, well, that's to do with malevolence and evil, she's searching to see whether these people are in pain and she's enjoying it and being gratified by it. Well, that makes her out to be a monster. And it could well be that that was the case. Equally, if you say, and you weren't aware that she'd been done for these crimes, and she was saying, well, I search because I desperately feel for these people. I want to know they're OK. I want to see how they're doing. I can't help but w- know what happens after that punctuation mark that occurred in hospital. You'd have total empathy with her. It would be totally normalised. That's what people do. Hey, that's why Twitter treat t- trends, because people look for things and then join in. It's a normal cu- human curiosity. I guess when it comes down to the wanting to do memory boxes at maybe an inappropriate time, on the best day, that would be really nice because she wants to give you something to remember your children by. Or on the really bad way of looking at it, it's somebody who's excited by the idea of somebody's grief and pain and she should have had boundaries. So again, the reason I struggle with that is because in court, the prosecution and the defense are about winning. So the way you present things and the more convincing you are in presenting that, the more capable you will be of winning the case. If I am a great presenter, I will make you believe that everything I've just said was on the malevolent streak. And I'll do a damn good job of doing it because I'm very compelling and very convincing in those moments. And if I have a weaker person who's opposing me, they won't stand a chance. So again, yes, I can see how some of the behaviours wanting to be in the area where the very sick children were can be seen as terrible. Now we have what we believe is that guilty verdict and it being validated by a jury Therefore, that makes her into the monster that they're creating. But equally, if she'd been found innocent, I guarantee we'd be having this conversation now. And I'd be saying, isn't it amazing how normal human actions can be portrayed in a way that makes somebody seem evil and dark and dreadful? Of course. But um, actually, it was all innocent. Yeah. And, and uh, not that I'm saying, by the way, I'm like, I'm not saying that she, I, I, I agree with the jury's verdict. They, they were there. They did what they did. Um, I'm just saying that when it comes down to the legal process, it's interesting that very normal behaviours can actually be construed as very abnormal in the right circumstances. Well, exactly. And and uh, prosecution and defence counsel, they have to build a narrative that people, that a jury exactly. can understand. And they both do yeah. it. And that is the way the legal system is set up. Absolutely. There's nothing wrong with it. And of course, in this case, you know, because there's there's babies involved, clearly then there can't really yeah. be witnesses like you might get in a normal case. And maybe some of exactly. 
some of the forensics, they just don't apply as in, you know, a, a, a random attack. So that that's all their part of, a, you know, part of the picture. In in yeah. the, in the, the sort of the, the defense or the prosecution in their kind of summing up, they sort of, they basically said Lucy Lepi was playing God and got a got a trill from from maybe the attention and they also brought in the fact that she had a certainly had some sort of complicated relationship with a doctor in their uh, mm. romantic type of relationship though it wasn't really clear how far it had gone and um, mm. is that a normal is that really what drives serial killers that that need to control is that present in nearly all of these cases I mean, I definitely think that there's an omnipotence complex with most serial killers, if not all. I mean, if they're a random, disorganized, chaotic killer who's mentally unwell, then it tends to be very different to what we're talking about now. But obviously, those individuals can go and serially kill as well as individuals like we're talking about today. But when it comes down to somebody who is an organized or semi-organized and they know why they're doing it and the compass mentors whilst they're doing it, the omnipotence complex is definitely there. That sense of knowing that you can make the choice between life and death. I mean, that is the ultimate control. For most of us, it's the worst idea of control ever but if you happen to have a psyche where areas of your brain just don't communicate effectively so you don't have the empathy and guilt connected with the fear and anxiety that would usually motivate us to do things that are positive not negative if you don't have a sense of fear if you don't have a sense of morality and ethics that the average human is blessed with because of the way that our dna and our brain works then you're looking for kicks you're looking to feel alive and I think that that's one of the things that people don't really understand about individuals who are cold blooded psychopaths. To some degree, whilst I feel absolutely no sadness for them, you know, they are terrifying creatures. Nonetheless, there is a part of me, because I am a human being with empathy, who thinks, wow, it must be really awful to not feel like I feel. So I feel things in a really weighted way. And it's very overwhelming sometimes for me. And I'm very blessed with that, like most human beings are. Imagine feeling like, everything is kind of black and white. There's just nothing really nuanced and there is nothing really great or terrible. So these killers will often want the high, the rush that they just can't get on a normal daily basis because their neural pathways just don't do it. So the killing for you and I would be the worst thing, particularly of children. I mean, the worst thing we could ever even conceive of but for them, it's maybe reaching a point where you or I could get from having a really romantic evening with our partner or going on a really scary ride at the pleasure beach. So they don't have that capacity, which is why that sense of playing God reaches something for them that means that they feel. And so, yeah, we see definitely male organized serial killers. That would absolutely be what they say. Richard Ramirez you know, he took the eyes from one of his victims because that was ultimately what fed him that sense of, yes, I got to feel that fear and I was able to choose when to snuff their life out. And they needed to relive that because everything else is so black and white. So it's definitely contextual with that. And if she was doing it because she ultimately wanted, as you said, a level of praise and hero worship, whilst also watching the catastrophic disintegration of the emotional experience of those loving parents in front of her eyes that is multifaceted because usually what happens in serial killing is you're not really there for the after effects that's why we see serial killers forensically follow cases they can't truly be a witness because they have to remove themselves from the scene of the crime whereas if you happen to be a healthcare professional and you are the person who's been involved in the killing and in the care and then you are trusted and you have an opportunity to witness the, as I said, falling apart in front of your eyes of these human beings with this unconditional love for this baby that they've lost. Well, it's not just an immediacy of gratification. It's a consistent experience and enthralling of that gratification. So it moves further than it would ordinarily do. So if you're bringing it back to that playing God, well, you wouldn't just be playing God in that moment. You'd be watching and witnessing the experience of the afterlife, so to speak, for you as a killer, because you're getting to watch and witness the destruction of those in front of your eyes who are affected by it. So in a sense, it must be like an addiction, really, then, if somebody is is sort of trucking along underneath the 
underneath the level of, of normal happiness, normal joy, normal experience. Therefore, that must drive them to take risks where they kill people. Again I think that. Again. I think that the word addiction, it would be nice to be able to offer them the word addiction because then we could have some empathy and sympathy with their actions based on the fact that they would be a helpless individual being essentially transported by their desires as opposed to being in charge of them. But of course, they're clearly in charge of their feelings and faculties because they can not do it for very long periods of time. Sometimes decades serial killers will not kill for. I don't think it's necessarily addictive. I think it's that They live in fantasy a great deal and they enjoy the experience of knowing they can, but they won't. That maybe you could be their victim, but maybe you won't be their victim. I think that fuels their desire. So I think it's more about desire and knowing that you can be in charge and power of this horrible destruction, but you can choose not to be equally. So you really are God in that circumstance. You know, you choose to allow people to live knowing that you have a capacity to take their lives. And that's something that I think really fuels serial killers. They are equally, as far as they're concerned, an individual who allows people their freedom and their life and fortune because they know that they have their power and will within them to take it from them. And that in itself is a very attractive, desirable creation for them psychologically and emotionally when they are so devoid on the whole of knowing feeling in the way that you or I would. It's it's the case has thrown up a huge amount of uh, controversy about how it was handled by the by the system and um, you know how there there seemed to have been warning signs that that were ignored then it went into a kind of very modern world of you know where the doctors were forced to apologize to Lucy Letby at one stage for kind of moving her off the wards. Is there stuff to be learned from this case um, as a psychologist and also just as in for the healthcare system in general? I always try to approach things, seeing every perspective. I think that's just because I've worked in therapeutic field for such a long time that I always know there are different stories and everybody has a different narrative. And usually everyone's a victim in their own story as well. That's just the way that we operate in life on the whole. So I can fully understand why senior management would not believe that she'd done it because evidentially they probably didn't feel that saying, well, Lucy Letby is always there when a child dies was firstly acceptable to investigate because she was doing all these extra shifts, but also that it's incredibly, incredibly challenging for them to start thinking of somebody that they've employed as a serial killer. It's terrible for the hospital and it's terrible for the babies. And so it's easier to have this bias where you're like, well, no, she's been a great advocate for babies. She's in our magazine. People think she's wonderful. We've not had any complaints of other people about her. And therefore they are resistant to run in and to make it that she's the person of interest so I do understand that level equally I've seen witch hunts so I have worked in environments where I have literally seen a group of managers or in this case we could say a group of doctors failing in what they're doing and then pinpointing an individual vessel to blame that happens regularly so what we don't want is to say well the doctor said this because they already have an inordinate amount of consideration in our society, you just have to think about COVID. I mean, doctors were lauded as heroes, not, they're just ordinary people, but they were lauded as heroes and you couldn't say anything against them, right? So they already have a level of respect in our society that I think, you know, to some degree earned because of what they do, but also is a little bit overinflated at times. So if we're going to say, well, a doctor said, or a group of doctors have said, this person's done A, B or C, that would be a travesty and it'd be terrible if we're just going to automatically go, well, that person's definitely guilty. Equally, we have to say, so what's the bridge? What's the boundary between what they said versus what senior management have said? So ultimately, what I think is really important is that early on, when these questions are asked from now on, because the thing is, you have to be incredibly cautionary where babies or children or vulnerable people are concerned. It is better to be very very concerned and be risk averse as opposed to take risks in that situation. So I think that what they'd have to do is say, if these kind of issues come up again, where anybody has an idea that a member of staff may be acting inappropriately around patients, they have to just accept that there is an investigation that needs to take place 
straight away. Now, that's without saying that person's guilty. It's without that person finding themselves in a situation where everybody knows about it. It's not about punitive response. It's just about saying, look, we've seen what happens when we don't act. So what we need to do is say they might not be right. It might be a witch hunt. They might be trying to cover their own backs. So we're going to investigate everybody. So that would be a deterrent, which means that the doctors or nurses or individuals in corporate environments who are saying that this is happening in a certain circumstance, that everybody feels the weight of responsibility of investigation so that the best outcome is for the patients, which is we're not going to just look at one person. We're going to look at a range of people and how that's impacting on the environment. And also, I know this sounds really obvious, but I genuinely think in the most vulnerable of situations, we should have CCTV everywhere now. In America, we do. You know, in America, when a mother killed her child because she was somebody with Munchausen's by proxy, we know because we saw her do it. And I think that that's very important. So for me, what they should be doing to protect themselves, both as professionals and in management and the nurses, because we've got to protect the nurses as well. Can you imagine how many people now are going to be looking at nurses? And these are people who are highly vocational, as are the doctors. They're trained for years to get to this discipline all they want to do is save lives and people are now looking at them and imagine being I had a NICU baby so my baby not the one I've just had but my first son he was on intensive care because he was preterm and I would be thinking very differently right now about nurses and it's not fair and not deserved but there's damage done so what we want to make sure is that what we're saying to the public is lessons have been learned and I think CCTV some people would say it's a gross invasion of privacy, but I think it's an actual necessity for protection these days. And I think that a lot of patients would feel that they could trust their children to these establishments if they knew that they were staff were being watched in that respect. And the staff would be at a level of protection because they're doing a great job. So they've got nothing to hide. No, and I think there is a difference between uh, CCTV or cameras in a, in a hospital environment and asking someone I agree. to put it in their home. I think it is, it is a different thing. And also it, yeah, is, it is really easy to be uh, wise after the fact, isn't it? When exactly when like these go wrong, you know, they should have done this in terms of inquiries. It's, it's not oh, always, totally. thing, you know, it's not always as straightforward as that. Well, I mean, the thing is that the senior management definitely didn't want babies to die. And those doctors definitely didn't want babies to die. I mean, the doctors in particular, with respect, they actually chose a field, which I think is probably one of the most terrifying fields to work in, which is pediatric medicine. I mean, preterm built babies are so vulnerable. To do that job, nurse or doctor, it's absolutely blindsidingly terrifying as far as I'm concerned. And I think you have to have a massive vocation and empathy and a belief that you are willing to put yourself on the line to save the lives of these children. So arguably, we know that the doctors would not have wanted anything terrible to happen to those babies. But arguably, again, I draw the line that's suggesting that senior management, and believe me, I'm quite happy to call people to account. I do it all the time in the way that I do. But I know that they would not have wanted terrible things to happen. I don't think they were just protecting the hospital. I don't think they were just protecting Lucy Letby. I think they were going through the humanness of believing it was impossible to imagine that a Beverly Allert was once again walking the halls in the hospital and stealing the lives of the most vulnerable in our society. Well, no doubt there will be an appeal and no doubt we'll come come back to you then, Emma, and see if we ever get any more answers. In a funny way, I sort of think we probably never will uh, mm. fully fully get what 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 we're we're looking for then. Have you any plan? I know you just had a baby yourself, so it's probably the last thing on your mind, but you've no more plans to return to Ireland and any more shows coming? Oh, I'm definitely going to be coming back to Ireland. Yeah, I love Ireland. You know what? I love how welcoming the Irish people are. Every single person that I've met has just... And in fact, when I was doing the venues as well, just such lovely experience. They are so well looked after. So I'm coming back with Killer Cults. So I'm doing cults next. I'm doing kind of the merging of serial killer leaders, essentially, yeah. with the outcomes on their population. So, yeah, I'll definitely be back. Can't keep me away. And I'll be bringing Etta Blue with me. That's... She's just my little She's my little tour. With, I'm back on tour already. So she's <laughs> right. just my little, my little sidekick, my little crime sidekick now. Yeah. Well, just keep her off the radio mic and I'm sure it'll go well. Yeah. And maybe also my husband keeps saying to me, do you think she's going to grow up a bit strange on the basis that she's constantly around you talking about murder? And I'm like, well, it could go one way or the other, couldn't it? We'll see in 25 years. <laughs> really, really well. <laughs> Thank you very much, Emma. It was great talking to you. 
catch up again. Take care. Bye.